Thank you so much for the prayer. I feel a special inadequacy as I approach this text because it is significant beyond my ability to communicate and I'm praying for spiritual wisdom and understanding for myself and for you. I'm so happy to be in a knowledgeable group that will search the scriptures daily, whether these things are so. And what I fail to say or articulate clearly, I'm praying that the word of God will have free course in your life because it is alive and active and sharper than a two-edged sword and can pierce to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joints and marrow, discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's appointed unto every man, the book of Hebrews says, once to die and after that the judgment. And I'm convinced that on that great day there will only be two groups of people. Those on the right hand will hear the words, well done, the others on the left will depart to everlasting punishment. And I believe there will be degrees of reward, have authority over five cities or have authority over ten cities. I believe there will be degrees of punishment. Those who knew their Lord's will and did not do it will be beaten with many stripes. Those who did not know and committed things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. But I still believe that ultimately there will be the saved and the lost, just the two groups of people. However, now... I believe in the eyes of God there are three groups of people, and you may have overlooked that. Anybody know what those three groups are in the eyes of God? Amen. Give that, give that man an A+. 1 Corinthians 10.32 that in the eyes of God, and this, Brother Given, changes the way we read the news, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, he's appealing to people to not use their liberty to cause anybody to offend. And he said, I don't want you to cause anybody to stumble, neither Jews nor Greeks nor the church of God. Amen. Now, when we die, on the, the, the only Jews... Who are going to be saved are the ones who come to Christ. So, but, so ultimately at judgment there will be two groups. But now there are three groups. And God uses Israel to teach us many important things. You know the passage in 1 Corinthians 10. The Hebrews were all in Egypt. They all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. And God said this was an example to you and to me. It is my view that the book of Hebrews was written around A.D. 64 to the Jews. These were the ones who first... Receive Christ. The gospel was to the Jew first. And for 10 years or so, they preached to none but Jews only. And they had a remarkable unity so that not one of them said all of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. As many as were possessors of lands or houses sold those things, brought the price of the things that were sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. But this amazing generosity made them vulnerable in time of famine. So Agabus came down to Antioch and appealed to the brethren. They sent money to the elders in Jerusalem by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And then when the Jerusalem council was conducted, they reminded Paul, don't forget the poor, these people here, in Judea are facing poverty. So as he went throughout the Mediterranean world receiving alms for the poor saints in Judea, I personally feel that God orchestrated this to humble the Jews so that they would receive Gentile money. Remember, after 
collecting this money, Paul wrote to the Romans. Romans chapter 15, he said, Pray that I will be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea. That was a very real concern because when he got down there, over 40 Jews took a vow they wouldn't eat or drink anything until they'd killed him. Pray that I will be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea and that my offering for the saints will be accepted. It's amazing that he had spent all this time collecting the money and wasn't even sure that when he got down there the Jews were going to accept it because it was Gentile money, some of which, for example, in Corinth, may have come from places that Jewish people would abhor. But the Jews did accept it, and Paul wrote two or three years later in the Ephesian letter, God had broken down the middle wall of partition, made of the two one new man, so making peace. There was one church, one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Yeah. Now in this letter, I think Paul gives some very serious warnings. 1 Thessalonians 5 said, Warn them that are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, support the weak, and be patient towards everybody. Sometimes people need to be warned. And the Hebrews, I think, needed to be warned. And so there are a number of passages in the book of Hebrews where these people are just dangled over the flames of hell almost, you know, to, to get them to straighten up. Notice chapter 2. You must give more careful attention, therefore, to what you have heard, so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received a just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? Chapter 3, verse 1. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Chapter 3, verse 12, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Chapter 4, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Chapter 5, he said, I wanted to give you meat. I couldn't because your babies I had to feed you with milk. Chapter 6, he warns them of a condition from which it is impossible to be renewed under repentance, saying they crucified of themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. Conventional wisdom is that during the law, there was a very strict God, and during the age of grace, there is a very lenient God. But God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in fact, the book of Hebrews indicates that we in this age, the age of grace, are going to be punished more severely if we neglect this great salvation. Amen. Hebrews 3, if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense, of reward, how are we going to escape? That's right. Chapter 10, admonishing them not to forsake the assembling of themselves, you know, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sorer, greater punishment. Suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, had done despite to the Spirit of grace. In chapter 12, we <clears throat> have a great contrast between the physical and the spiritual. We haven't come to a mountain you can touch. It burns with fire, thunder, lightning. Even Moses did exceedingly fear and quake. I haven't come to that. That's not what Christianity is. Christianity is something spiritual. It is Mount Zion. It's the city of the living God. It is the heavenly Jerusalem. It's an innumerable company of angels. It's the congregation of the firstborn ones whose names are written in heaven. It's God the judge of all. It's the spirits of just men made perfect. It's Jesus, the mediator of a better covenant. It's the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. And the reasoning is, if they didn't escape from a God who spoke from the earth, how do you think you're going to escape 
if you neglect the voice of a God who speaks from heaven, and if the God who shook the earth is a terrifying God, what about the God who shakes the heavens and the earth? And the passage concludes, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And so this passage that I've been assigned brings us right down to where the rubber meets the road to perhaps the most relevant question that you and I could possibly consider, and that's doing the will of God. As it's already been referenced, Jesus said, I didn't come to do my own will, but I came to do the will of the Father who sent me. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. John 6, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but I should raise him up in the last, in the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one who sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And you're all familiar with that scene in Gethsemane where his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down upon the ground. He fell on his face before God and said, let this cup pass, but nevertheless, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou. He prayed that prayer and came back an hour later and found the disciples to sleep. Prayed it a second hour, came back, found them sleeping. Third time, and each time the Father said, drink the cup. And I remind you that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down on the right hand of the majesty in the heavens. If you don't understand that, you don't understand what it means to do the will of the Father. <laughs> the Hebrew people were killed by fiery serpents because they murmured against God. Jesus didn't do it. He didn't do it. Now, we are told to pray. Jesus told a parable to the extent that men ought always to pray and not to give up. There was this judge who was unjust and there was an importunate widow, and you know that story. And there's sometimes when... The people of Nineveh get right with God. He forestalls the punishment. There's a time when Hezekiah got right with God that he gave him 15 more years of life. And you and I are to pray. <laughs> oh God, let this cup pass or whatever you have on your earth. There's nothing wrong. God wants you to. He teaches us to pray. He said that the man at midnight was given what he wanted, not because he was a friend, but because of his importunity. So you and I need to pray and pray and pray. And Jesus said men ought always to pray and not to faint. But when God says no, don't you dare grumble. Don't you dare grumble. God will not take that lightly. Apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh. I personally believe it is, was a result of the stoning he received at Lystra. I believe his head was bashed in. And the man who had been mistaken for a Greek god spent the rest of his life almost blind and unable to speak art in an articulate way. He said to the Galatians, I bear your record. If it had been possible, you'd have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. See how large letters I write with my own hand. Acts 23, he was before the high priest, couldn't even see him. Here's a guy with this huge miter on his head, and Paul said, God will smite you, you whited wall. And they said, you talking that way to God's high priest? I, said, I didn't know he was a high priest. He's gathering sticks, Acts 27, and a viper comes out and bites him on the I don't think he could see well. He said in 2 Corinthians 11, though I be rude in speech, yet not in not. I he, 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 talk, he couldn't talk like he used to. And he said, God, take it away. Take it away. 
Make me like I used to be, handsome and articulate. God said, no. He prayed again. I don't know how long, maybe hours, maybe days. I don't know. God said, no. Stay just the way you are. It's the way I want you. He asked him three times, and every time God said, no. And he did not grumble. He didn't. He said, you know, God's right. Let God be true and every man a liar. God's right. You know, if I hadn't had this happen to me, I would have been exalted over much because of the abundance of revelation. Isn't God good? Isn't God wonderful? Hallelujah. We can rejoice in our tribulation. For our tribulation brings patience and patience, experience and experience. And hope makes us not ashamed. Because the love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit is given unto us. Jesus said, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. He said, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven, same as my mother, my sister, and my brother. David served his own generation by the will of God. Five times Paul said, He was an apostle to the Gentile, or an apostle by the will of God. Paul wanted to go to Rome by the will of God. He was on his way to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit testified in every city that bonds and imprisonment were waiting on him. Now, brethren said, don't go. And he said, what do you mean, don't go? I'm not only willing to go to prison, I'm willing to die for the name of the Lord. And said, okay, the will of the Lord be done. It's the will of God that by well-doing we put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. The Holy Spirit makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The Ephesians were not to be unwise, but understanding what the will of God was. Slaves were admonished to obey their masters, not with eye service as men pleasers, but doing the will of God from the heart. Sometimes our suffering is even according to the will of God. John said, those who do the will of God will abide forever. James said, don't you ever say I'm going into such and such a city and going to buy and sell and get gain because you don't know what's going to happen. You should say, if the Lord wills. Now I want to talk to you about the original sin. Generally speaking, we say it happened in the Garden of Eden, but I think it happened before that, and I remind you of two very familiar passages in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. We're talking about Jesus who came to do the will of God, and I'm trying to make it sin exceeding sinful so that you won't want to have anything to do with sin. It's just been within the last little while that I stumbled onto this verse. I'd read it many times, but it didn't hit me until recently. An oracle is within my heart, Psalm 36, 1 and 2, concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. No fear of God before his eyes, for in his own eyes he flatters himself too much to detect or hate his sin. I got an oracle in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked, and no fear of God before his eyes. He does whatever he wants to do. And he flatters himself too much to even detect or hate his sin. <laughs> there was an old joke about the pilot who took this woman up and did all sorts of loops and spins and scared the dickens out of her. And she said, you know, Every sin I ever committed flashed before my eyes in an instant of time. And it was so interesting, I made him do it seven more times before I I would quit. Now, that was told in in a joke, but would Jesus have laughed at it? See, that this is what I'm praying about, is that The wicked flatter themselves so much they don't even detect or hate their sin. Something to watch over and over again and something to wallow in. Well, in Isaiah 14, and we have a dual application here and also in Ezekiel, 
The king of Babylon is the primary one addressed, but it couldn't be referring to the king of Babylon as you'll see when I read the passage. Isaiah 14, verse 12. I think it's talking about the devil, Lucifer. How have you fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn? You've been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned in the mount of the assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountains. I will ascend above the tops of the cloud. I will make myself like the most high. We're talking about Jesus submitting to God, saying, not my will, but thy will. He was God, and yet he didn't count that something to be grass, but he <laughs> emptied himself. The devil didn't do that. Amen. Ezekiel 28, this primary reference is to the king of Tyre, but it also describes the original sin where the devil made a deliberate decision, I am not going to do the will of God. I'm going to do my own will. Ezekiel 28, 14, you were anointed as a guardian cherub, so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God. I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud on account of your beauty and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before King. Now you don't have to be the king of Tyre or the king of Babylon to want your own will. Every sinner, you can be 10, 12 years old and want your own will. That's why you gotta repent. The word repentance, metanoia, literally means to change the mind. Times of ignorance got overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. And he has given assurance that this is important because he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And so the writer of Hebrews, Peter on Pentecost, you as parents, you as preachers and teachers, we exhort one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. With many other words did he testify and exhort them. You can change your mind. You do not have to be a self-absorbed egomaniac only concerned about yourself. You can, as Jesus did in Gethsemane, open your hands to the Father and say, Father, not my will, but thine be done. Karl Marx said almost identically what Satan said. Here is a poem, part of a poem written by Karl Marx. It was called Human Pride. With disdain I will throw my gauntlet full in the face of the world and see the collapse of this pygmy giant whose fall will not stifle my ardor, then will I wander godlike and victorious through the ruins of the world and giving my words an active force, I will feel equal to the creator. It just almost causes cold chills to go up and down my spine when I read the words of Karl Marx. Our president began his professional career as a community organizer. It is generally agreed that the father of community organizers was Saul Alinsky, who died in 1972. 
but he wrote a book called Rules for Radicals. Here is the dedication of that book. Lest we forget at least an overall over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical from all our legends, mythology, and history, the first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did so effectively that he started his own kingdom, Lucifer. That's the dedication of Saul Alinsky's book. The purpose of the book, he said, in this book, we are concerned with how to create mass organizations to seize power and give it to the people, to realize the democratic dream of equality, justice, and peace. It is better to die on your feet than to live on your knees. And this means revolution. You can believe in Saul Alinsky and follow his advice, or you can believe in Jesus, who on his knees, on his face before God, said just the opposite of what that man's teaching. Amen. Just exactly the opposite. The whole world lies in wickedness. Satan is the God of this world who blinds the minds of them that believe not, lest they should see the light of the glorious gospel. He could say to Jesus, all these kingdoms I will give you and the glory. But you're going to have to think selfishly. <laughs> you're going to have to quit this thing about pleasing God. You're going to have to think about yourself. You can have it. I have the ability to give it to you, but you can't think about You can't put God first. You've got to think differently. And dear brothers and sisters, that's the message of this scripture. It's from the 40th Psalm. And in the original, in the Psalms, it adds some things that are not in Hebrews 10, 5 through 7. One of the things it adds is the piercing of the ear and, you know, the symbolism. In Exodus chapter 21, the slave by law after six years was set free. But if the slave said, I love my master and I don't want to go free, they pierced his ear with an awl and he was a slave forever <laughs> that's what Christianity is all about denying yourself taking up your cross following Jesus the second reference is to the writing of the law on the heart that's in the 40th Psalm but here in Hebrews 8 Hebrews 9 Hebrews 10 it's the new covenant what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. I want to close with two stories. First from Hudson Taylor who was born in 1832, went to China in 1854, died in China in 1905. This is just a few days of his life. We're talking about not my will but thine be done. We're talking about people who do everything without murmuring and complaining. That's in Philippians 2. Paul was in prison and he wrote four prison letters, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon, but he never complained. Not once. <laughs> it's an ungodly thing to do that. July 1856, Hudson Taylor's mission was destroyed by a fire. His instruments and his medicine were gone and 30,000 copies of the New Testament. He set out to the city of Ningpo to buy more supplies on August the 4th. His feet were so blistered from his Chinese shoes that he had to hire coolies to carry his baggage. They were opium addicts and they ran off with his baggage. The items stolen included his medical instruments that survived the fire, his clothes, his traveling bed, two watches, his wife's picture, two hymn books, and a Bible given to him by his mother, and a box of money. He found a low-class inn and dined on cold burnt rice and fried snakes. 
That night he almost got no sleep because he was lying on a hard bed. He was pestered by mosquitoes and he was afraid the drug addicts would rob him. Next morning, the innkeeper devalued his money 25% because it had a chip on it. Feeling sick, he sent out for a hanging. Though it was only eight miles away, it took him all day in the blistering sun. The locals came out to see the foreigner and he preached to them. No inn would give him lodging and at 1 a.m. he could go no further and he sank down to the cold ground from a, across from a pagan temple. A pagan statue frowned down upon him. He s drifted off to sleep and was awakened by a beggar groping him in search of money. Two more beggars appeared and Taylor feared to close his eyes that they might kill him. He sang hymns and prayed in English till the beggars left just before dawn. At sunrise, he was shaken awake by a young addict demanding money to buy opium. At this point, the jaded, exhausted missionary lost it, seized the young man, shook him, threatening, don't you ever touch me again. When the city gates opened, Taylor relented, gave the man enough money to buy some candles. Betrayed, indignant, perplexed, and hurt, the great missionary was at the end of his tether. But I remind you that God will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able and even Jesus had an angel come and minister to him. Amen. The good news, Hudson Taylor never asked for an offering. That was a part of his commitment to missions. <laughs> when he got back to his base, <laughs> there was an envelope full of money that had been sent weeks before, but it covered all of his due expenses. Aren't you glad that we have examples like this who say, like Jesus, not my will but thine be done? And he said, you know, God, you orchestrated that time of hardship so that I could identify with the sufferings of Christ. Rather than complain, I, I keep repeating this, but Philippians 2 14, do everything without murmuring and complaining. Do it all. Don't do it. It reflects a bad attitude. It reflects a rebellion against God. The final story is about Charles Thomas Studd. Born in 1860 in England. Father was wealthy. By the age of 16, he became an expert cricket player. At the age of 19, he was a captain of the team at Eton College. He became a Christian at 18, but like so many, he was only a nominal Christian. <laughs> uh, someone used the illustration that the father left instructions for his son going out of town. He said, son, I want you to do four things. I want you to mow the grass, trim the hedge, wash the car, and paint the shed behind the house. Son said, boy, that grass needs mowing, looks terrible. I'm glad to do it. The hedge, really, you can't see out the windows hardly. I've trimmed that hedge. The car's so dirty, I'm ashamed to take my girlfriend out on a day. I'm going to wash the car. But that shed out behind the house, nobody can see it. I'm not going to do that. Question. Did he obey his father 75% of the time or not at all? Not at all. Because the only thing he did was what he wanted to do anyhow. I have an oracle in my heart about the exceeding sinfulness of sin. <laughs> There's no fear of God before his eyes. And in his eyes, he's flattered so much that he doesn't even detect or hate sin. And what we're talking about is rebellion. I mean, police pulls you over and says, get out of the car, put your hands above your head. You don't do it. He had not got the slightest idea what you're going to do because you're rebelling against authority. So there was an atheist who said this to Charles Thomas Studd, the young Christian 
The atheist said, if I firmly believed, as millions say they do, that the knowledge and practice of religion in this life influences our destiny in another, then religion would mean everything to me. I would cast away earthly feelings as vanity. Religion would be my first waking thought and my last image before sleep sank me unto unconsciousness. I should labor in its cause alone. I would take no thought for the morrow except as it involved eternity. I would esteem one soul gained for heaven worth a life of suffering. Earthly consequences would never stay my hand or seal my lips. Earth, its joys and its griefs would occupy no moment of my thoughts. I would strive to look upon eternity alone and on the immortal souls around me, soon to be everlastingly happy or everlastingly miserable. I would go forth to the world and preach in season and out of season, and my text would be, What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? The atheist said, If I believe what you say you believe, that's the way I'd live. But I don't believe that. That's why I live the way I do. Charles Thomas Studd repented. <laughs> Put God first. He went to China in 1885 and chose to eat, dress, and work, live like the Chinese peasants that he might win them to Christ. At the age of 25, his father died, and he inherited a vast fortune. He gave it all away. One gift alone was 30,000 pounds. He gave it all to Christian causes. He saved only 3,400 pounds as a wedding present for his bride. Three years later, he married this Irish missionary named Priscilla Livingston Stewart. When he gave her the 3,400 pounds, she gave it away. In 1900, they moved to India. In 1910, to Africa. That's where he died. His teeth gone, heart attacks, sick much of the time. No complaints. Forward ever, backward never. Some wish to live within the sound of a church or chapel bell. I want to run a rescue shop within one yard of hell. C.T. Studd, 1931. Jesus came to do the will of God. That was a message to the Hebrews 2,000 years ago. But it's just as relevant now as it was then. C.S. Lewis said, on judgment day, there will be two groups of people. Over here are the saved who say to God, thy will be done. Over here are the lost, and God says to them, thy will be done. That's what Lucifer said. I'm not going to do the will of God. I'm going to do my own will. That's why he's going to be destroyed in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone forever and ever. And you don't have to go there. You've got a choice. Jesus pleads. <laughs> Jerusalem. I wanted to gather you together as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings. Why wouldn't you do it? good the divine invitation is still there let's pray oh father how rich how powerful how significant is this truth that Jesus did not come to do his own will but your will May we, dear God, follow in his footsteps and say and do the same in Jesus' name.